Alright, I am uh, Brady Smith. I'm with Johnson Controls, and this is the training for the, the new YK uh, centrifugal chiller at the Utah Valley University Hope Science Building. Um, first thing to get started, if you look over on the side of the control panel, you'll find that we have the, a, a nomenclature tag that has the model and serial number of the chiller. And that is, that is useful if you guys need to call and order replacement parts or maintenance parts. Or if you have any issues with the chiller, that's sort of the first things we'll, we'll need to know. That uh, that's that's what we use to locate our, our parts lookup guide, and so that's uh, that's why it's there. And uh, we'll need the model and serial number if you have any kind of a service request or a parts request. Now this chiller is a YK, which in, in York's world uh, specifies that it is a high pressure centrifugal. This machine. Over here has a solid state starter. This is a liquid cooled solid state starter. It actually has a, a fluid running through it, which is a, uh, an inhibitor. It, uh, in reality, it's a kind of a, a glorified reverse osmosis water. Uh, it's, uh, it's been purified, and then they, there are inhibitors put in it, which uh, prevent it from trying to pull the minerals back out of the, the, the copper and the aluminum that's running through within the starter. This chiller also has, and this is a frequency drive, it is a frequency drive oil pump. The oil pump is located, it's a submersible, and it's actually located inside of your oil sump, or your oil separator, your oil capture, whatever you might want to call that. This is the microprocessor control for the chiller. This is your evaporator barrel. Opposite the evaporator barrel is the condenser barrel. Up on top you have your drive train, which consists of the compressor, and the electric drive motor. Now this chiller, if you want to pull up the panel, it has several uh, screens on it. Right now we're going to go to the sales order screen. This will give you all of the pertinent information regarding this chiller. It gives you your, your temperatures in and out of the evaporator and your condenser. It gives you the required gallons per minute. These are all indications that need to be met in order to deliver the 600 tons of capacity this machine is designed for. If we go out of these parameters, then you, uh, you lose your, your, your kilowatts per ton, which you were, were promised or which the machine is designed to give you. Now this machine is designed for comfort cooling. So on your set points, right now you have a set point of, of 43. If we go back to our sales order screen, it actually set for, this machine is designed for a temperature of, of 45. So when you're running at 43, you may not be getting 40, you know, 600 tons. You're getting a little under that. But like I say, that's uh, it's made to run in those parameters. This machine can actually run down with water in it to 38 degrees or as high as 55 degrees. Uh, the machine can be set for lower temperatures than that as long as the brine content in the evaporator is adjusted accordingly for freeze, for freeze, for freeze prevention. But any, anything out of the, uh, the set is a bit of a This machine is microprocessor controlled, All right inside the, the motor here. This is your, your microprocessor or your motherboard. This machine is set up with uh, multiple temperature pressure transducers and uh, uh, pressure transducers, temperature transducers. All of those run through ribbon table and come back in and feed their information to this microprocessor board. Everything you need to know on this machine is at the touch of a button. So, all of these pressure transducers, if we can find an example of one that we can get on the camera. They're a little tough to find, but I'd have to go to the other side of the machine to see them. But for instance, your evaporator, your condenser, all have a, a pressure transducer on them. When you pull up the, uh, the, the system screen, it'll give you a readout of your temperatures and pressures. You can also pull up each individual device on its own. This is your evaporator screen, your condenser screen, your compressor. So you can pull up the information you want on each individual component. If you go back to the system screen, it gives you a brief overview of the entire machine as far as your condenser waters and pressures, your evaporator water and pressures, um, oil pressure, that type of thing. Now, this machine is, is, uh, is a standalone. Uh, you guys have a, a building automation control system for it. But once, uh, once it's given a command, 
it already has the set point programmed into it. At that point, once it starts, its design is to run until it reaches set point. So upon the start sequence of this machine, when you go to start it, you'll go into a, a pre-loop, which you've probably watched on these other machines. At that startup, you will go through a sequence, a start sequence. The chiller will turn on the oil pump, and you'll hear the frequency drive ramp up. This machine is set for 35 pounds of oil pressure, so the, the frequency drive will ramp up until we're running at 35 pounds of oil pressure. After we've hit that set point, then the, the machine will go on for about a, about a 20 second count, and then it will command the chiller uh, drive to start. Now, once the, once the drive starts, you'll hear it fire up, and then you can pull up on the motor screen, and you can read your set points, it give you, gives you the readout, your voltage that it's running at, the amount of current per leg that it's pulling. So you can actually check your, your current your current imbalance, voltage imbalance right at the screen. Um, all, with the push, all with the punch of a button. Now, when the machine starts up, this one it being a, 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 a soft, term as a solid state starter or a soft start. So you don't have the, the inrush that you get with, uh, say, a cross-the-line starter, and you get less of an inrush than you do with a, a Y-delta starter configuration. So as the, the, as the machine commands, so it can come on. This is your starter component right here. You have a main breaker. This is your trigger board. So as the machine is commanded to start, this trigger board will actually begin to fire all three phases of power, and from stop to fully st to uh, full capacity on, or full RPMs on the motor, generally occurs in about three and a half to five seconds. So you'll hear the machine come up; it, just, it rolls up very quickly, but you don't have the inrush of a contactor start or a Y delta start. Back and close that <laughs> now, we look at the major components on the machine. Once the machine is up and running, you can pull up the, the individual components as far as the, the, the oil sump, the motor, the compressor, and get all of your readouts on, on that. Now, I know you guys take daily logs, and so that's always a good idea to, to keep those uh, daily or weekly logs. Uh, just to give you some idea of, of uh, how the machine is operating, and if, if you start to see a, a difference in those operating parameters, you've, you've got a log. It's a really good indicator of uh, what's going on with the machine. Now, if you want to pull up the motor screen, for example, and you can actually actually log your voltage and your your current at any given percentage. You can also check your your oil sump versus your operating parameters, and make, make sure that you're you're still developing a full. Uh, Full oil pressure. Now some of the other features on this machine, since it is a high pressure centrifugal, in addition to the, uh, the vane actuator, which controls your capacity, this also has a, a variable geometry diffuser, which is made to help limit the amount of noise and also helps prevent the surge condition if the, if the chiller finds itself running out of normal operating parameters. And you're probably used to seeing on these other machines, over here and have a look at this. Your main actuator, which these other machines have, and that's this, this, this motor here, which drives your veins, you'll notice up on top is another one, another actuator motor, and that is the motor that's designed to operate your variable geometry diffuser. When that comes into play, if the machine is, is uh, running noise or if it begins to surge, the variable, variable geometry diffuser is made to open or close the gap on the discharge side of the impeller, and that will limit the amount of surging and the amount of noise that it's making. Now, if we go around to the other side of the machine, over on this side, down under the belly of the chiller, you'll notice in your liquid line, there's a motorized valve down under there. That is uh, the variable orifice valve. Now what that is set up for is we can, uh, that is programmable and to a percentage of capacity of the, of the condenser. And we set that up and it can limit the amount of refrigerant going into the evaporator. 
And when it's doing that, it's also stacking a certain quantity of refrigerant in the condenser. We do that because if you can stack refrigerant in the condenser and expose it uh, for a longer period of time to the temperatures from the cooling tower, especially on uh, cooler days like today, when you can run your cooling tower at lower temperatures, we get the refrigerant chilled more so that it's colder when it goes into the evaporator and it gives you better efficiencies. This right here is a refrigerant, um, refrigerant driven oil cooler. And our oil comes off of your separator or your sump, goes through this heat exchanger and it's actually cooled by refrigerant. Stacking the refrigerant in the condenser is also the means by which we provide a, a full column of liquid to provide enough cooling to the, the compressor oil. This component right here is your oil filter. And if we come around to the back of the machine. Now we discussed earlier that this is a, a liquid cooled starter. So you'll notice on this, this uh, reservoir on the top is where we fill the, the, the coolant loop or the coolant reservoir with the inhibited fluid. And then every time the machine is running, this pump starts and it circulates this, this coolant or this inhibitor through the starter. That heat then runs through a heat exchanger pipe and that heat is given off to a loop into the condenser water. So we use the, 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 the coolant to cool the starter and then that heat is then dispersed out of the starter and out of the starter fluid into the condenser water through this heat exchanger. Now I've, I've been asked the question, why do we use condenser water if we're trying to keep the starter cool? That's what I've always wondered. Here comes your answer. If you try to run uh, chilled water through the starter and you're running at say 45 degrees, at that point in time you can make condensation. If we get condensation in the starter, electricity and water don't mix. So that's the reason why we use the condensed water, because it doesn't get cold enough to give us uh, condensation. Because uh, a lot of these machines are used for um, pro, you know, production or low temperature conditions. And at that point in time, if you're making 25 degree water, then you really get it cold. So they're all set up to cool with the condenser, and that, that, that keeps the starters you know, 115, 120 degrees, which is perfect for their operating. They, they can run at those lower temp at those that high of temperature without any defect or problem with them. So that's why we're cooling it with condenser water. Uh, some of the other features you'll find on this chiller is anytime you have a, a, a problem, say there's a, 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 even if the machine is sitting here and it's not running like right now, it is tied into your power grid, so it can it can uh, it monitors the power 24/7. So right now it's monitoring your voltage. Now you might come in here when the machine has been off and find some kind of a message up here in the message center. That can that can happen even if the, even if the chiller is not running, because as long as it is as long as the power is on, we're constantly monitoring the power, the pressures, and the temperature of the machine. If we get to a point where the parameters are out of operational um, acceptance, then you'll, you'll get a message up on the message center. Now if you pull up the history, it will actually capture the last 10 histories and the time that they occurred. You can actually go in and pull up the details of each individual history and page through it. When the machine shuts down, it gives you a, a, an operational snapshot of how the machine was running when it actually turned off. And it, it's a good troubleshooting tool and it's a good, good way to find out where, where to start looking if you have a problem with the machine. Now if the message center gives you a, a readout in red, that is a lockout condition and the chiller needs to be turned off and reset to, to uh, clear it. To reset this machine, if you throw this rocker switch all the way to the right hand side and then rock it back, that clears the, the fault. If you see in the message center that we have a, a, a message in orange or yellow, that tells us that we had a problem with the machine, but it has cleared itself and it's ready to run. It's, it's inform, information only. Um, the thing that's nice about this history 
is that you, you can track by time of day. If you have a shutdown that, that continues to happen on a regular basis at the same time, you can track it that way. If you find that uh, we're getting a, an occurrence of, of, of a power fault and it's happening at the same time of day, it's, it's a good troubleshooting tool to give you an idea of, of where to go and start your, your troubleshooting. Um, now some maintenance we need to perform on this machine. Since it, it is going to be running seasonally, we recommend that you, you brush the tubes at least once a year. Uh, we recommend an oil filter change once per year. We recommend changing the solid state starter fluid once a year. And along with that, uh, it's, it's always a good idea to uh, pull an oil sample, have your oil, out, have your oil analyzed. And also when this machine is not running, um, every six weeks to two months, we like to make sure that the drivetrain is, is turned. That prevents us from getting a, a dry condition on the, on the shaft seal. Now, in addition to that, this machine is set up when it is not running, it actually has a standby lubrication set up on it. So when we turn that on, every time that the machine is not operating for a 24 hour period, it will actually go into an oil lubrication. So anytime that it sits for 24 hours and doesn't run, the oil pump will come on for, for uh, 90 seconds and that lubricates the, lubricates the shaft seal. And that's, uh, that's what we do just to keep oil on the seal to make sure it doesn't dry out. But in the off season, we like to make sure that that, that chiller uh, drivetrain is spun. Now that can be, uh, uh, depending on how your, your system is set up, if you have uh, water in your towers, I know uh, some facilities will just come out and start the chillers for 30 seconds. If you don't want to go through the hassle of that, uh, pulling the, the covers over the shaft seal and uh, hand spinning the, and once you get in there, you'll see that the, the, the coupling to the, the compressor from the motor, and it's just a matter of spinning at two or three revolutions just to make sure that we, we get that, that those seal faces lined up at a different point. If you uh, leave a chiller or any, any device, whether it be a pump or this type of thing, off for six months, and don't rotate it, that's when you tend to you know, get an abrasion or a rough spot on your, your seal when you go ahead and start the machine. So that is the purpose of the oil lubrication, is to make sure that you always keep that, that seal in an oil bath, but uh, manually spinning this, uh, this drive train is, is recommended anytime you're sitting off for more than six weeks. Are there any questions we haven't hit yet? There are answers we need. Do these other two chillers have that feature? The question is, do the other two chillers have the feature? Right off the top of my head, I don't know. We can go over and have a look. Okay. And we'll find out. Anything else we didn't cover? Just dying to know? All right, that does it for me.